Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. Hey, doing baseball fans, and welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show. And I tell you, call your friends, tell them to go to your favorite podcast platform, whether it's Spotify or Apple or any other of these platforms that stream this show, or go to our YouTube channel, watch it after you hear it. This is going to be a spectacular show. Uh, we are here uh, covering the game that we love. Major League Baseball, one of the game's most beloved personalities, upcoming author, former two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, baseball lifer, direct from San Antonio, none other than Gibby himself, Mr. John Gibbons. John, how are you doing today? Johnny, I'm doing good. I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it, too. You know, we, uh, I always enjoy, you know, look forward to the show. And then we, but I got an old buddy, you know, one of the top uh, baseball guys in the game, uh, Alex Anthopoulos, Double A. Thank God you can call. He's got a nickname, Double A, because you got to pronounce that every day. Anyway, anyway so it, it's it's going to be it's going to be a great show. Um, it is, it yes. is, and, and and because you know this show and the impact of this interview, and it was more of a conversation, John. It wasn't even an interview. It was a conversation between uh, two friends who worked in different organizations together. Uh, it's going to be a two-parter. So we're going to play part one today and then part two next week uh, because once you two started conversing with each other, it was just magic. So uh, uh, I can't wait for everybody out there to to listen to what you and Alex had to say to each other today. It's well, you know what, Johnny? You know, there's uh... – you know, we're, we're friends more than anything, right? Yeah. But he, he was also my boss. He gave me he gave me a second chance in this game. Mm -hmm. He really took care of my family and everything. You know, and but the, you know, there's some he he's he's a, he's the kind of person he, I admire because of what he stands for and, and and how he treats people and all that. So we 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 naturally naturally hit it off. We didn't always agree. You know, we had our battles. Like, but that's okay. You know, that's I think that's what's missing from the game now. You know. Everybody's got to toe the line. Everybody's got to be politically correct. Everybody's got to do everything right, right? But no, if you want to get something right, sometimes there's going to be. It's like a marriage, you know. You get and I, if if you agree with your wife on everything, you know what? It's probably a little shallow. Put it that way. At least in my family. There you go. Uh, we also have big news uh, for everybody. Uh, of course, we're going to cover uh, all the breaking uh, news uh, that happened with the Blue Jays this week, and of course, the World Series teams have been determined. Uh, so we'll be go over, going over all of that. But we also have uh, something special for the Ask Gibby segment beginning this week. Uh, it is Budweiser coming in to offer a really cool uh, promotion uh, for those who ask Gibby a question. And because that's what buds do. And uh, we welcome Budweiser to that segment today. So that's going to be an exciting uh, thing to cover later on. Perfect. Perfect. But uh, let's go to the leadoff. I mean, there's uh, big news in baseball, but the biggest news uh, up in Toronto is the fact that uh, they don't have an interim manager anymore. They have signed uh, John Schneider officially, making him the manager of the team. Uh, Ross Atkins signed him to a three-year deal with a team option uh, through 2025, a team option for a fourth year, so he could be there till 2026. So, uh, the Jays got their manager for at least the next three years. And, you know, Johnny, that, that's good to hear. You know, I, I don't know what took him so long, but, that you know, Johnny must have uh, – Schneid, Schneid must have a great agent or something. He was really holding out and he got uh, – because it, it, it took so long. But, you know, he did a tremendous job. He really did. And, and uh, he knows those guys. They have confidence in him. And, and uh, yeah, it's one of those things. You never – you know, there's, these jobs, are they're, they're volatile. You never know how you're, long you're going to last. You know, and it all comes down to how, you, whether you win. You know, the guy that you know that we're talking to later, he'll tell you that right there. It's a production business, as it should be. Um, so, but you know, he, you 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 hope it turns into a long term relationship for for all of them. And uh, because Johnny's a good guy, you know, uh, uh, so we wish him well. I'm he's trying, 42 years gonna, old. Hopefully, he'll come on this dang show. You know, and, and yeah, that and would tell be us, a great. That would be a great guest. And so he can, he can tell us how much he's making. I could I can compare it what they paid me. If they're paying him more than they paid me, I got a problem. Then you got a problem. You know some Italian friends up in New York, I think, right? Oh, no, Irish, man. I got the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> but he's 42 years old. He went 46 and 28 
as the interim manager uh, when he uh, uh, got the job after they replaced uh, Charlie in July. And Toronto finished as the top AL wildcard team, 92-70, and 70, swept out of the playoffs, as we all hate to say, but it happened. Uh, but uh, it looks like, um, you know, uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, time now for the Jays. And uh, and here's a place that you've been before. I mean, you know, you're inheriting a coaching staff, and some of the guys that are on the team uh, as coaches uh, date back to when you were w- with the organization. Um, there's always those rumors about whether or not major changes or adjustments are going to be made. And, you know, I know you like to talk about, you want to bring your own guys in and his coaches were inherited. So uh, uh, what they're saying officially, uh, Ross Atkins said that the process of selecting the coaches is collective, which means it's a collective decision based on, you know, the front office, the manager, but at the end of the day, go ahead. I mean, the end of the day, he said said it's a manager's decision. And that's not really true, uh, is it? No. When you say collectively, does that mean they're also asking the guy that's probably might get fired? <laughs> is he part of the collection? Anyway, no. You know what? Um, you know, I, I don't know what they're thinking. I, I do know coaches' staffs now are a lot bigger than they used to be, and I think yeah. there's, there's a little bit of excess out there. If you want to know the truth, um, you know, I do know uh, Louis Rivera was my third base coach. He's been there, and in, in you know, I think he was getting kind since of 2011. Point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't know he, where he's. Pete Walker. Coaches. Pete Walker's been there he, since 2012. Yeah, but you know, Pete's one of those guys. Uh, you know, he, he's so good at his job. You, you're crazy if you, you let him get away. That kind of thing. But, but yeah. in, in reality, does the manager select his staff? No, they may say that, but he he doesn't. He may get one or two of his one. Now, if you're Bruce Bochy, which hey, I tip my hat to the Texas Rangers, that tells me they're trying to win. Man, this guy's got three three championships. He's selecting his staff as he should, right? Yeah. Okay, as far as like John Snyder or myself, when you know when I started out and new to the game, no, that that doesn't happen. Like I said, they may tell you that, but I, I in, you know, and you know what? It's it's if you think about it, the coaching staff there, and, and Schneider was a part of that before he got the job. They're pretty Bench damn coach. good, man. You know, I mean, yeah. to get to that point, they're all doing their job pretty darn good too. So whether and there may be a little excess, uh, uh, but. Yeah, he played it down the middle in his press conference. He uh, says he thinks the current group returning is the expectation, and hopefully everyone is back in some capacity. So um, he's uh, going to have some decisions, but you said the front office has to make those decisions as well, and it'll be interesting to see who stays, who goes, who's brought back in. Uh, but that kind of, you know, that solidifies the Toronto Blue Jays' uh, uh, managerial situation. And uh, before we get into covering uh, what's, you know, what's going to happen in the World Series, I had a question for you that's kind of related to all of this because uh, Major League Managers jobs uh, are out there. Uh, There are openings. And uh, uh, we understand that you uh, took a trip down to Miami and uh, got a call to uh, talk to them about the Marlins job. So kind of give us a little insight on what happened. If you, you know, as much as you could talk about it. Uh, I think everyone would be interested to know what happened down there in Miami with you and the Marlins. I think I went down there to Florida to do some deep sea fishing, and try to catch some Marlins or something. Oh, did you? Did you get a, Did you get a Marlin? <laughs> I caught nothing, man. I, I mean, I went down there with high hopes and you know some great bait, a great, uh, uh, great boat captain. Nothing. No, it. Uh, yeah, I, I did go to go down there, and I was excited about it. I thought. Um, you know, one thing about the Marlins, they have a really good pitching staff, right? And, and, you know, I think they they definitely underachieved this year. You know, they had some key injuries. You know, that's, that is part of it. But they they got a foundation that you can win with because of that pitching staff. And, and I would have th- I thought I would have been the perfect guy. I think they need a veteran guy. But it looks like if you, when you see their finalists, they're probably going to go with a first-timer, which is fine. But I was well, really – Well, that could be a financial situation. That could be financial too because they, they're not uh, – they, they have a history of really not spending. What do you think they couldn't afford me? Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm I'm saying that uh, your experience and what you've done in the game in comparison to the finalists that are that are currently up for the job, you're talking a big disparity in regard to experience and and you know and and probably a financial commitment to somebody uh, which would be at your level. I mean, you, well, I don't know about that. Hey, you know what though, Johnny? You know what the what they pay actually pay managers 
you know, your top end, I'm sure, you know, Bochy's well, a fraction of the players. Yeah. Right. And in, in, in uh, the difference between a first timer and a guy that's been around in certain spots, it's probably not that much. If it, 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 it shouldn't really matter. It depends on, you know, if you're trying to win or you're trying to do things, but you know, they got a good list there and, and it's kind of, you know, they have the, uh, you know, the fair hair boys and the names that are being thrown around in baseball the last few years about the next managers. And, uh, but I, I was really impressed, uh, you know, Kim Ng down there, you know, brought me down there. I, I really liked her and, and I think she's getting, you know, doing a great job and in her, yeah. her supporting cast in the front office, really good people, you know, and, and uh, I enjoyed it and, um, you know, so, but they're, they're going to go a different direction. I respect that. Yep. Well, I'm sure that. But, uh, yeah, so I ain't ever going deep sea fishing again. I'm going to go in the back bays and fish for redfish and trout for crying there out loud. There you go. Right, you're, right in your backyard, my friend. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that was interesting because that circulated around and uh, we, we felt that we really had to ask you about it uh, just because of the people that listen to this show each and every week. Um, and uh, They got to deal you know, with me now. What so happens at, at all? What happens at all of that is now we get to keep you longer here. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> no, I think it's yes. going to be good. I think it's uh, good. I think each and every week the people are just loving uh, hearing your insights about the game. And, uh, and well, we got a good show, the, man. Well, you know, and we the really conversations, man. The conversations are wonderful. We do have a good show. And hey, listen, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we have World Series coming up beginning uh, this week, this Friday. The teams have been determined, and it's a surprise in one way and maybe not that much of a surprise in the AL. The ALCS, the Houston Astros swept the New York Yankees four games to none. They won uh, the final game in the Bronx in front of a very disappointed crowd, uh, winning 6-5. to five. Um, Astros uh, now uh, four out of the last six years in the World Series. So you got Houston. Uh, who are favorites. They were favorites in the beginning. What a great team. What a well-oiled yep. machine they are. Yeah. You they know, Johnny, really- yeah, they're, they're the, you know, well, obviously they had the best record in American League. You yeah. know, it was three months ago, I think, we know when the Yankees were being talked about one of the greatest teams ever. And, you know, I think they in the last month or a couple months, they were like 500, basically. They had some key injuries and, and all that. But, you know, the Astros have been the class of the American League. Uh, they have. And now they kind of put themselves in a different category. I think you know, if you look at it, you got the Astros, the Dodgers, right, and the Braves. You know that that are viewed as the top teams, and they get there every year. So now, now it's it's like the old Yankees used under George Steinbrenner. You know, they, I don't think they necessarily judge them like that anymore, but I think the fan base is a little bit fired up. But it's like you get to the playoffs every year. You're ex- almost expected. You got the resources to do it. That's not good enough anymore. You know, it's now it's all about winning the big prize, you know, the the, the championship. So the Astros are kind of in that spot now. I think they won one. And that was the year of the cheating scandal. You know, getting there is not good enough anymore. You know, they were there last year and the Braves beat them. Yeah. Same way with the Dodgers. You know, the Dodgers, you know, they've been there how many years straight or in, get to the, get deep in the playoffs, but have only won one. You know, that's uh, – so, you know, when, when you're that good, you put yourself in a different category, and that's when the pressure starts because nobody cares if you make it past the first round because that's not good enough for you anymore. Right. Well, I think uh, Jays fans and Mets fans would love to just be in be in this situation right now. Hey, you know what, though? Hey, Johnny, it was kind of – I don't know if it's funny, but, you know, I've been raving about the American League East, right? In the, yeah. In the, and now it seems – you know, it's now it's the National League East. But the, you know, the, the, uh, the Rays got – uh, bumped too straight, and then the, you know yep. Seattle did that to Toronto too straight. Now the Yankees, even though you know they get they got the you know they got they got past Cleveland, but then Houston bumps them four straight. You know it's like right. they're not even winning. You know, and, it, and uh, which is kind of surprising to me. Um, but now you look at the National League East, and you know uh, Anthopoulos is on there with us. You know they, uh, I mean they're, they're they're talked about as one of the best teams, and they're going to be yep. for a long time. But the Phillies, I think they were the last team to qualify, right? The Phillies were the last team to qualify. They're in the World Series. They uh, they really handed it to uh, uh, their opponents. They 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 were able to beat the Padres three games to one. And you know something about the Phillies, and they came back from such a deficit in 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 the beginning of the season, towards the middle of the season, until they changed managers. But this team is on fire. The chemistry, the excitement. I mean, when you look at Bryce Harper hitting like the home run of his career to give the Phillies the lead yesterday in the eighth inning, 
I mean, I I was, and I'm a Mets fan. You know how deep I bleed oh, orange and blue. Gosh. But You're I couldn't bleeding. help I couldn't help but get excited about seeing the Phillies and and just I kind of fell in love with the team. And I and that's a that goes against anything about being a Mets fan. But I am. I am hoping that the Philadelphia Phillies win the World Series this year. I love the team, and I love what they've done in the second half and in these playoffs. Uh, what fire in their bellies, all of them. Oh, yeah. Well, you're a National Leaguer, dude. I'm an American Leaguer. That's, that's true. Year. That's true. What, you know? The Astros are always going to be National League to me. Oh, that's true. Yeah, good point. That's that's a good point. It should be a good series, you know. You know, the Phillies are riding on emotion. They, You know, they, they, got, they got great talent. Yeah. But it really, you know, Rob Thompson's done an unbelievable Oof. job. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Girardi is a good baseball guy. Yeah, but 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 something it was like a breath of fresh air. Or they, they or something happened. You know when when after he got let go, and that's what you know that does happen in, in sports. But Tom's done a great job holding together, and it's kind of freed him up. And it's like they got nothing to lose in, in uh, you know, because they got a, a serious lineup, and they got oh, they yeah. got the names as far as pitching goes. It's just a matter of whether they put it together, and I think they have now. So it should be kind of an intriguing series. You know, to be honest with you. Yes, it will be. Uh, I mean, and uh, by the time we do our next show, we'll be knee deep into uh, this the series after three games. Do you have a prediction for the World Series, or do you want to wait uh, until next oh, week's show? Man, but I, I think it's time to say you it know. now, right? You gotta, you gotta give a prediction. You want me, you want me to wait till somebody's on the verge of winning it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Let's Whatever's see. easy for you, John. I mean, uh, who, who do you? Who do you think? You know what? You know what, John? I, I got to go with Houston. You know, I think they got just have too much pitching. Right, that they can equalize some of those big bats of uh, the Phillies, and they've been there. You know, I mean, you, yeah. you ha- yeah, you have some guys. You know, the Phillies have been there as well. Well, they haven't but, been in the World Series since two thousand nine. Right. So that you know, guys that played other place. You know, you're right. talking about Bryce right. Harper. Uh, yeah, you got some winning. Uh, maybe maybe there's not. There. You know, there may not be many more than than, than him, but uh, Houston's almost destined. You know what? Dusty Baker's almost destined. You know, he, he's had a oh, tremendous dusty. career as a player and then as a manager. It's almost like he deserves this. You know, he finally he got there. You know, the Braves beat him out last year. Yeah, you know, it might be it might be the icing on the cake. He goes on to win it, but yeah, and he's hey, never won a World Series title, has he? He's been in the World no, Series. No, you know, he's always he hasn't won as manager. Teams. Right? They, you know, I think you know. Of course, he got there with, when he was managing the Giants, but the Angels beat him. Yep. You know, went back when he had Barry Bonds. And he got to the playoffs with the Cubbies. Remember they had the uh, – who was the guy, the controversial play on the foul ball? I think he was <laughs> – oh, Yeah, yeah. Well, Moises Salou was like going crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, so, yeah, he's been there. He's, he's got a chance to manage some really good teams in some really big cities. It's almost like, you know, he's, he's such a good guy. It's like he de- he deserves it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we, we focus heavily on the Blue Jays, and we're talking about a Canadian boy. You know Rob Thompson, who's the yeah. He's got to be. He's got to be the manager of the year. How could he not be, right? Oh, I, you know, that's so Walter Bucky, your boy Bucky, and uh, you know led the Mets back in the, to to the final weekend. It's got to be Thompson. I don't think they think? voted on. It. It's got to be Tom. How could it not be? You know they were they were they were destined. But you know what else? And before we forget here, you got to highlight, especially since we're speaking to a GM today. But this guy's a president, Dave Dombrowski. Oh yeah. What a job. Everywhere they go, I don't care where he won it with the Marlins, Detroit. When it, they, yeah. you know, he, he, you know, with the Red Sox, and now he's with the Phillies. I don't, I, you know, I'm not so sure he gets the credit he deserves because I think he's kind of a dinosaur. He, he's got that old school mentality, and but he, he's, he's a lot like Anthopolis in my mind. You know, I don't know, I, I don't know him necessarily really well, but I've spoken with him and I, and I watch him. You know. Th- you can't let him slide by either because everywhere no, he can. goes, he wins. You know, and and, yeah. and but he's he's not that typical Ivy League. Right, he's crunch. not a Theo. He's, he's not a, a Theo guy. guy. Right, right, right. He just yeah. made some great Very decisions and built guy. built a pretty pretty good ball club who are in the World Series against yeah. the Houston Astros. Well, this I, hope, year. I hope that's not overlooked because he's uh right. you know he's been what a career he should be he, you know what he should go into Hall of Fame when this all said no they win it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the leadoff for you. And uh, now, John, I mean, uh, an incredible guest coming up, Alex Anthopoulos, uh, the current president of baseball operations for the Atlanta Braves and the former GM of the Toronto Blue Jays. What an incredible, incredible career this guy's had. Now it's time for the Gavin with Gibby segment. 
We're back for another Gabbing with Gibby segment, and yeah. this one is going to be a special one, everybody. John has done it again. Uh, we are bringing you on for this segment uh, one of the foremost baseball executives in this game, a guy Gibby knows very well. They go way back. He's the former GM of the Toronto Blue Jays. He's now president of baseball operations for the 2021 world champion Atlanta Braves, Alex Anthopoulos. It's going to be a great segment, Alex. Welcome to Gabbing with Gibby. Glad to be on. I, I think Gabbing is the right term because speaking coherently with Gibby definitely wouldn't be the title I would use. <laughs> so I think Gabbing is well appropriate. Great job, guys. Hey, hey, when he said president, are you the, really? Are you? Is that your title, the president? It's, I mean, president? it's just the title, President Baseball Ops. Damn, I, you know, I, I kind yeah, of same thing. It's the same job. We just keep changing. Hey, I was a bank teller, but they call me a customer service representative. It, it sounded better than bank teller, right? That's how the world works. Hey, well, hey, I, I know uh, personally. I'm excited to have him. You know, we go, we do go way back, and in, in, uh, uh, more than a professional relationship, we're friends. And uh, you know, Alex has been really, really good to myself and my family over the years. He gave me, uh, we got to know each other my first go around in Toronto when he was an assistant. Then when he took over, he gave me new life, you know, and we went back and we went through a lot of ups and downs and some battles together. In the, and finally, everything kind of came together after 22 years for a city and a country. And, uh, uh, you know, Alex is, uh, you know, the friendship stuff out, one of the best baseball minds out there. But more importantly, uh, he's just a good guy. He's a great guy to work for because he'll listen to you. He, he's, he knows he's got to make the decisions, but he'll listen to you. You know, and not, I can tell you everybody out there doesn't do that. So I tip my hat to him, but, but okay. So, so as far as all the lovey dovey stuff, let's get, now down. you get to the real stuff. Get to the real. Up. What do you think? Hey, what, 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 check out the baseball. What, I mean, what's your nat naturally you guys have a hell of a team, right? We all know how the baseball works. You know, you, you, you can get into the postseason and somebody's hot, and that, that's that's the way it goes. But you, you look at what you did last year, and you look at what you, your team accomplished this year. What's your take on this whole thing, though? I mean, is uh, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, look, obviously um, it's my – I'm trying to think now. Five seasons in Atlanta playoffs, but – so one in Toronto, two in L.A., so I guess eight – Eight in a row, which is awesome, you know, and I definitely yeah. I remember the five in a row that I didn't get in as a GM. So, um, and I remember that first year when we did get in, R Russell Martin in the clubhouse was like, ah, ho-hum. I'm sitting there thinking, how is he not excited, you know? And you could take it for granted if you're not, you're not careful. But, um, I mean, look, the teams that all get in, they're all good teams, right? So you look at the Phillies, they have a ton of star power. They have a lot of great elite players, and they play great, you know? And we just got beat, and that's just the reality of it. Um, it's a reminder of the grind and how hard it is and how much you're preparing and planning. And, um, you know, we just it's a reminder just how hard it is when you do get in. Um, but I think the big thing is you want to feel like you have a team that has a chance to win the World Series. And I look at, for me, the two hardest times, you know, the, the losses that were tough, 2015 Toronto because you felt like we had a team that could win the World Series. 2020 Atlanta, we were up 3-1 in the NLCS. We lost it. And we felt like we had a team that could win the World Series. So I think as a GM, you want to feel like you put a team together that once you get in, you know, you're not just glad to be there. My first year in Atlanta, 2018, you know, we got in, we won the division, but we were probably a little short to win the whole thing. Um, and we were just, it was a great achievement just to get in. But it's the missed, missed opportunities because you just don't know that, you know, the next year if you do get in, are you healthy? Are you guys ready? Are they having good seasons? And that's why when things are coming together for you during a season, you got to take advantage. I mean, I feel strongly about that because there's no promises. There's no guarantees that, you know, the guy having the Cy Young season or the guy having the MVP season, or the guys that are healthy, that's going to happen the following year. So um, you get hot at the right time. You got a good club. Uh, but you do want to try to get in each year to give yourself a chance. Grant, lad, you sound so spoiled now, man. You're in there every freaking year. You know how I am hard spoiled. spoiled. You, hard, you know how hard. <laughs> you, know, you know, but I will say this. You know, uh, I, I worked for you in Atlanta, you know, uh, and, and so I know I know about that team. But you guys, the Braves, the Dodgers, Houston, and somewhat the Yankees, right? Okay. You got you guys have like, uh, you know, it's almost like it's a, not a given. It's not that easy. But, you know, exp teams, 
or the baseball world expects you guys to get in every year because you know you've proven something. You got good teams and all that. And and, uh, and that, that's kind of what I'm talking about. You know what? It uh, you know there's teams out there scratching and clawing just ready to get in. Because I remember when we were in Toronto, it took it like twenty some years. You know, so that's it's uh it's you 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 really got you've climbed to a new level. Uh, and that's not easy to do. Everybody can't do it. Everybody doesn't have the smarts to do it. Everybody doesn't have the will to do it. And uh, so you're spoiled for crying out loud. There's some there's some uh, there's some teams out there, man, would just die for to get in that thing. No, you're that's right. Funny. And it's, um, you know, I think about it, but I, I worry about it each year. I mean, you know, we win the World Series last year and then all off season and in the spring training, I'm getting asked questions. How do you repeat? How do you repeat? And I'm sitting there thinking, how do you repeat? How do you get in? You know, like that's just a foregone conclusion. You know, I think, you know, one of the offseason, you know, you, you try to learn in these jobs all the time. And I look back a lot and um, I didn't love our, you know, 2019 going into 2020 offseason. I'm sorry, 2020 going into 2021 um, because I felt like I started to get ahead of myself. And I was like, ah, we have to build a roster to win in the playoffs, win in the postseason. And some decisions we were making was, you know, we were falling short in the playoffs and, I lost sight of the fact that you got to get in. And I started thinking, well, in the postseason, you need this, you need that. And some of the decisions we were making, whether it was signings or trades or whatever, um, it was all like, hey, this will help us in the playoffs. But you really, that's where you make mistakes in this game where you just, you get ahead of yourself. And it's hard to get in. Everybody in the division, everyone's working, everyone's grinding to get uh, back there. But um, look, I, I remember those times in Toronto. It's like, man, are we ever going to see the playoffs? Are we ever going to do it? Are we ever going to experience it? And uh, I operate with a lot of fear, not fear for financial employment, uh, any of that kind of stuff, fear of just failure. Right. And that's, you don't want to be a failure. You got kids, you got friends, family, you got pride, got an ego, whatever it is. Um, I, you know, I see this place, right. You know, you look at Atlanta, the battery, which is the surrounding area of the ballpark. You know, they almost sold out every game or we almost sold out. I'm not involved in those, those sales. So um Almost 3.2 million fans. That's we've, we're a capacity of 40,000. So we were three one and change, um, and TV ratings and all of it. Everything's going really, really well. And I call it keeping keeping the machine going, you know. And I feel like there's a lot of pressure and stress that we got to keep the yeah. machine going. And if we don't have a good product out on the field and we don't make good decisions, the whole thing comes to a halt, right? I mean, people want to come see a good good product. So um, you feel that stress and the pressure to be able to get back. And you know, I'm, I'm a sports fan now with my kids, and I follow the Hawks, the Falcons. You, you know, fans want something to come to the ballpark for. Raptors, them. man. How can you leave the Raptors? I used that? to love the Raptors. And, you know, I, I'm a big believer when you live in a city, you live in a community, your fan base is the same. I got to live and die with those teams. And also, those teams treat me great. Look, the Raptors treated me great, too. The Leafs did, too, when I was there. But I live here, and hopefully I'm here for a long time. And – um I, you know, and I like being a sports fan, right? I lose the ability to be yeah, a sports yeah. fan. So, um, you know, I, I just – but I, I realize now, like, it's important that I, I need something for to watch and I'm, our kids want something to watch and you want stars and this and that. So um, yeah. it, it's – you want to keep the thing going and I don't take it for granted because I know you're one year away from – you don't get in and then all of a sudden it's how we going to get back there. Right. It, uh, Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah, I had a question because you built such a great foundation with the Atlanta club. I mean, uh, this year uh, you extended Spencer Strider six years. Uh, a few months earlier, Michael Harris II, uh, Matt Olson, Austin Riley, all of these uh, long-term agreements that, for players that are at a young age. And also you have uh, Ronald Acuna Jr., Ozzy Albies. You, you've got such a foundation of guys that are going to be Atlanta Braves for many years. So is that part of your strategy and philosophy? Do you get this competitive team on the field each year that you get into the playoffs and build this core of players that really gel together? Uh, it was a wonderful team to watch this year, even though they spanked my Mets. Uh, but uh, I'd, I'd like to know your philosophy on on the strategy of, of signing all these guys up to extended contracts. Yeah, I think, look, I think the biggest – you know, I was asked this, I think, when we did the Harris signing or the Harris or the Riley signing. I don't remember which one, but what what do I what keeps me up at night in, in this job and what I worry about? And it's the sustainability piece, the maintaining competitive, being competitive. And look, in Toronto, the same the same way. I mean, we I remember going into 20, 2015, um, you know, we were offered um, really good players for Osuna. 
uh, for ha- for uh, tra- Travis, who we had just traded for. But Roberto Zuna was a, a young guy with big upside in high A. He hadn't made his debut yet. Uh, Travis is a guy we had just traded for. We love the bat, long-term middle infielder for us, the way we viewed him. We could have got now pieces to help us, and we didn't do it. I was going into the last year of my deal, but you always operate like you're going to be there 10 years, 20 years. And even at the trade deadline, uh, we had made those moves. We were trying to get Jay Happ as a last piece. Uh, we had spent all of our money. Um, we still had the Vlad Guerrero Jr. signing that was to come, and that was going to be $6 million. And we easily could have taken that money and gotten Jay Happ. You know, he ended up getting traded to the Pirates because we couldn't add it salary. I remember we were talking to Seattle, and uh, we just were tapped out from a financial standpoint. So we couldn't add salary. Um, we could have easily said, look, Vlad Guerrero Jr. at the time, we didn't know he'd be a, an MVP candidate and so on, but we liked him a lot. Uh, we could have said, look, we're going to – forget the signing. We're in the moment. We're in the now. That's four or five years from now. You know, let, let's go take that money and go put it in, into the team trade deadline. And we didn't do it. And even um, I remember we were talking to, to Oakland about Ben Zobrist at the time and um, guys like Boyd, uh, Liam Hendricks, R- Rowdy Telez. Uh, those guys were all names in that deal that were being talked about. Telez was a guy at the time just didn't want to move because we didn't know what was going to happen with Batista and Carnacion. Bats, you know, Telez had power, had on base skills, was a left handed bat. We wanted to hang on to him. So we didn't trade him. Ultimately, we used some of those guys to get price. But so, you know, you come to Atlanta now, we've got a really good team. And, you know, I don't want to be in a position that we have to look at trading these guys a year or two from now because we're not going to sign them and they're going to be free agents. And we have to try to, um, you know, get value back and not allow them to walk out the door for a draft pick. I think from a subconscious standpoint, growing up a big Montreal Expos fan and seeing all those great stars leave, that was tough as a fan. You know, you get attached. We had a good team with the Expos. And, um, you know, and you see all those guys go. And in Atlanta now, from a payroll standpoint, we're in a great place. From an attendance standpoint, we're in a great place. There's no reason for us to not keep these players if, if they, they want to be here. So, um, you know, we, we we're doing them earlier than we want to. Ideally, you wait longer, you get more information and so on. But, you know, we made the decision that the time to do it was now. We didn't want to take any chances that things would change or guys might want to hit free agency and so on. And um, as long as they wanted to be here, we were going to try to get de- deals done. I wanted to touch on the Expos for a second because you, you brought them up and obviously you're an Expos fan uh, because I've, I, I've been – When I look at your career and I've seen incredible things that you've done, you started out as an unpaid intern sorting player mail. And then after you do that job, you go sit with the scouts and take notes. And it led to an internship as uh, as a scout for the Expos. Uh, You moved up the ranks and hired as a a scouting coordinator. And then you left for the Blue Jays after the uh, 2003 season. Tell us about those early years and what drove you. Uh, throughout your career as an executive in baseball? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I've told this story a lot, but, you know, I was um, just before, 10 days before I turned 21, my father passed. He was an engineer, had come from Greece. He went to McGill, um, started a heating and ventilation company, small one. But, uh, you know, just before I turned 21, he, pa- he, he passed. I started working there, and I realized two years into it, this is not my thing. I didn't take engineering. I didn't enjoy it. Um, it was heating and ventilation for airports and malls and big commercial buildings and so on. Um, and it just was boring for me. And I just, I remember being 23 years old thinking, am I doing this the next 45 years of my life? And, um, I just, I, at the time I'm not married and have kids. I'm like, I don't care about the monetary side. I want to do something I love. So I knew baseball, is something I loved and I wanted to pursue it. So I started just banging on doors and the only internship the expos had at the time was unpaid sorting players mail, but there was. No, uh, they didn't really have a plan for me. They just kind of gave me pass and credentials and shoved me in the club bus and said, go ahead and find your way. So even though I was capable of more, I said, I'm going to be the best uh, fan mail guy they've ever seen. I, I got myself a roller and set it up and, and did all that. And then from there, the media relations guy quit. I was there. They gave me the opportunity. I kept my mouth shut. I worked hard. Then an internship came up in Florida in international scouting. I did that for about a year and a half. But I always used it as a vehicle to get better. So when I was with the Expos uh, doing the media relations job, I'd, when I was done during the games, I'd sit behind the plate and watch games and write reports and show them to the scouts. When I went down to Florida, I'd go watch A-ball games. I'd go watch guys for the draft. I went to the Dominican. I went to Japan. I went to scout school. Um, 
I'd get all the yeah. VHS tapes and CDs and all that stuff. But I wasn't doing it to like get ahead. I loved it. I couldn't get an, enough of it. And I love the evaluating side of it. Even to this day, uh, scouting for me is the thing I enjoy the most. It doesn't pay as well as being a GM, but um, I love scouting. I love going to the park and evaluating players and so on. So, um, you know, but being with the Expos was the best thing that could have happened to me because I wore 20 hats because we had a really small staff and I got exposed to everything. I got exposed to development and so on. And then, you know, uh, the Expos were being talked about. They were going to move. I wasn't convinced that I'd be able to work in the United States. So when Toronto called to, you know, have me go work in scouting, I jumped at that chance. And um, from there, it just moved fast. Two years as a scouting coordinator, four years as an AGM, and then I got the GM position. But everything always came sooner than I expected it. Um, I was, you know, I was just, I was just happy to be working in sports and having a job that I enjoyed. And I knew what the alternative was, right? I knew the alternative was to do something I didn't like. And I was grateful each day to to get up in the morning and like what I did because I knew that 99% of the people out there don't enjoy what they, they, they do. And I don't think there's any amount of money or anything like that that'll certainly solve that. So, um, I just believe if you love what you do, I know it's a cliche, but you should have success in the long run and you, you should thrive, right? Because you do love it. And I remember I'd come home at night and I'd watch videos and this and that. I couldn't wait to be in the office. I'd go Saturday, Sunday, just because that's where I wanted to be. So I tell my kids that all the time, find something you adore, no matter what it is, no matter what it pays. And in the end, you should get to the top. Yeah. You know, Hey, you know, I can vouch for that 24 seven. So I used to get these freaking calls in the middle of the night. I'm going, <laughs> anybody, anybody sleep, sleep around here? But hey, I, I, this is what I'll tell you about professional baseball that I know. My experience, I've been in a long time, right? You get to the top. There's certain guys, there's certain general managers, there's certain managers, right? Some guys just love the job. They'll, you know, they'll do whatever they do. You know, it's it's a great living. It's all that. Alex, Alex is this way, and I can say myself this way. He was he wasn't in it for that. He was in there in it to win, right? And obviously, said it wasn't good enough just to. Well, I'm big, I'm a, a big league GM, right? Or I'm a big league manager. No, there's more. It's more to it than that, you know. Because you do, you make a great living. It's it's about winning. But I don't think necessarily all of them are obsessed with that. But uh, I, I got a quick story for you because when Alex JP Richardi, you know, in a uh, hey, Johnny right here in the middle, he was roommate me and JP and. Uh, oh man, that must have been hilarious. Oh JP yeah, we got. Had- Great humor, the one-liners. We still talk about him to this day. Some hey, of his two, hey, two Italianos, man, going like that with oh, two yeah. Irishmen. We're two Irishmen, the other two. But anyway, so I'm the I'm the manager. JP brought me over to Toronto, and uh, and Alex was one of his assistants. There was two assistants, right? And so after the games, you know, the beauty of baseball, and I think some of it's lost now that it. Uh, you know, the GM would go into the manager's office and you talk you talk about the game, right, strategy. And there's, You know what? The the GM would ask you, you know, what are you thinking here and there? And, and, you, and you know, you, you explain things. Now, you know, we can get offended. Managers can get offended sometimes. There's, there's no doubt about it. So, anyway, we'd go in there and it'd be, it'd, I'd be sitting there. And maybe it was after a crappy game or something. I'd, or may, I mean, I made a stupid pitch and change or something, right? And I, and I, I probably knew it. And then there was, there was uh, one of JP's assistants. There was Alex, his other assistant, right? They come in there, and, and, and JP was. We'd start. We just talk baseball, talk about the game, and JP would ask questions about the game, right? And so, uh, you know, he'd ask it. He's a, he's a general manager. He's got every right to ask, right? He should ask, right? But then this other guy, I'm not going to name names, but he's no. I don't know if I can remember. He would ask me some questions. And I'm going. It's it was irrelevant to what, what I'm thinking. I don't remember. I'm going. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know. I, I can take, you know, I can listen to the GM, but I, you know, I, unless this guy can make sense. I mean, that wasn't Alex. So, so finally I told, one day I told uh, JP, I said, listen, I said, you know what? You come in here all you want. You're my, my you, you're my boss. You, you talk about baseball. You know, that other guy's got to go. Sorry. I, I will not take another question. Blah, blah, blah. So, and so what he had to do. So Alex got lumped in there with, with uh, the other two. So they were, they were, they were, they were <laughs> so, so, uh, so then I, I didn't see- mind though, but I, I, I knew to keep my mouth. Look, there were times JP would just, you know, like you said, he was a very, like you said, hot blooded Italian and during games, this and that. And he might go into the office and close the door. And I'm like, I'm, I'm staying out, out of the way. Hey, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But as long as you ask no. me a sensible baseball question, don't ask me something. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. JP so was like about, right? very in tune. 
with so all that. So then I used to see Alex, he'd just be down in the clubhouse. That's why he was just absorbing everything from everybody. And I'd see him, I'd say, come on in, man, let's just talk some baseball, right? So that's one thing. You know, where you can be in this game. I don't, you could be in this game forever. You could be in every position. You know, everybody, everybody's always constantly learning. I was continuing to learn. Alex was learning. We just come in and we bounce things off each other. And I think that's one of his greatest gifts that I, I think a lot of uh, executives miss now is the interaction and the constant, uh, not the nut, they know it all. That, I'm not, not referring to that necessarily. But they, they, Alex was very good about asking other people their opinion or something, right? And, you know, because that's important. That's important in an organization because, you know, you might learn something. You, you know, we can sometimes put blinders on in this game. We see things one way, and you get somebody out here that, oh, okay, it might wake you up. But but Alex was very good at, at uh, asking everybody their opinion to a certain extent. But then he also knew he had to make the tough decision, you know. And everybody can't take – and I can, I will vouch for this. That everybody can't make a tough decision. Everybody doesn't want to because, you know, that then you know because then the bullseye's on your back. But that's part of the, these gigs, you know, if, if you want to be successful. And uh, – and I think I know that's why he's really appreciated. And I'm going to tell you right now, you got the best coaching staff in baseball, hands down. There's, there's no in in the and a lot of them are my friends, but they're you know they're seasoned guys. Uh, you got a couple managers on the staff. You got some guys that were really good players. Um, and I, I know you I know you lean on them, but I've also I also know that you're you uh, you know you, you you're into analytics. You know, the, the anal, anal, numbers and stuff don't lie, but you're smart enough to know, you know, there's another side of this and that, you know what, I got the guys down there in the trenches that can tell me maybe the psyche of these guys that we're dealing with. And I think that is lost in the game, you know, so I, I tip my hat to you. I went through it. I know these guys appreciate it. And I'm telling you, that's part of winning, you know, if, if uh, no, I definitely appreciate it. And look, it's, I always, I always say, I, you know, and I hope other people do it and, I try to keep score, you know, and I know JP Richardi, it's one thing I you know, learned a lot from him, but that's one of the things he talked about. I remember, um, you know, I, it just, it, this really stuck with me. Um, and again, he probably doesn't remember it and a lot of people don't remember it, but um, I remember uh, when Brandon Phillips was out of options with the Cleveland Indians and uh, they were still training in Florida. And I remember um, I was begging JP to get him, you know, and um, at the time we had Adams, we had John McDonald, um, and JP's like, well, we have to get rid of someone. I, sorry, sorry, J Johnny Mac, but I'm like, let's release Johnny <laughs> Mac and get rid of Phillips. Cause I, I these, you know, you know, and I remember I'd make all the road trips and I'd go early and I'd watch BP and, you know, he's really talented. And I thought he just looked good that spring. And, um, again, we didn't get him in the end. I understood like he's making the call, but I was going to give my thoughts, my, my opinions. But what struck me was the next spring, you know, so Phillips had gone to the Reds. He'd had a great year. The next spring, I'm sitting with JP in the stands, and uh, Phillips' name came up, and uh, someone said, uh, no one wanted the guy, you know, like, no one wanted this and that. And he said, no, and then J JP said, no, you know what? I remember Alex really wanted him. He begged me for him. He pushed for him. And even though we didn't get him, him remembering and being able to keep score was huge for me. It's just like... My opinion matters. You know, he's not going to go with me. He's the boss all the time. And trust me, I brought a lot of stupid ideas to the table that, you know, if he would have done, he would have, you know, he would have been crushed by the media. So I'm not saying I'm not trying to cherry pick something that I may have got right. But, you know, I always try to keep score. So I remember I remember Gibby being like you'd come in for the winter for some of those events. And I talked to you about players on the roster and you'd be saying guys to get rid of this and that. There were productive players that the stats were good. But you're saying, hey, clubhouse, why is this and that? And you were 100 percent right, you know. Uh, I'm not trying to crush anybody, but I remember you telling me, Shea Hillenbrand, the offseason. We got to move on this and that. Yeah, I remember. Um, you were adamant about it. And he was a good player. He had a good season with us. The all -star I remember team. some other guys. Um, I remember uh, really the turning point for me was uh, 2014. We had an end-of-season meeting with, with the staff. And um, all the, the coaches, it was you, DeMarlo, everybody. I remember being in that room. And basically – uh, you know, we hadn't made the playoffs. We were competitive again. We were, you know, trade deadline. We didn't add anybody and we ended up falling apart, but we were a game or two out the wild card at that time. But just going around the room and asking about the roster and so on. And it was the first time that I truly like let go and just had full trust. And even though a guy may have, their contract may have worked with our payroll, the numbers may have been good. And I'd be sitting there thinking, how are we going to place the production? But you guys said these guys are not the right fit for the team, the chemistry, the group. Uh, I went into the offseason. I'm going to give this a shot. 
And uh, I just like the other five years didn't didn't work. I'm going to do this one time and see if it works. And it changed my career, you know, and it just I needed to fail enough and get kicked in the teeth enough to finally end up getting there. But I've always told you this. I mean, you're about, you know, obviously, you know, I feel good about you with in-game and all that other stuff and managing the clubhouse, everything else. But I think when you're a GM and your manager can evaluate, it's a huge advantage, you know, and uh, you always could evaluate. You had a good feel for players. Um, and, yeah, we joke around and this and that and all that kind of stuff. But your content was always really, really strong. And I keep score, right, just like JP kept score at that, that time. And to this day, I remember um, – there's examples of here when I'm in Atlanta. We make decisions. People may be on one side or the other. I'll remind people that may, you know, I may make a decision, but I'll tell them, hey, here's why. I still want your opinion. And if a year later they're right, I, I remind them because I remember how impactful it was for me. Um, and I remember even when we signed Jose Batista to an extension, we weren't feeling great. It was a little scary. But, you know, half the group was in, half the group was out. It was a lot of money. He was older. And the group that was out on it, I, I remember sitting them down and saying, I value your opinion. I don't want you to, you know, not – I want you to keep bringing what you bring. But, um, yeah, I think it's important. I think you need to have some type of competitive advantage. We all have the data. We all have the information, the people you're around. But, again, Paul Beeston told me this. Not everyone's vote ca- will count the same, right? So it's up to you to know where everyone's strength is and what areas. So – just because a coach likes or doesn't like a guy, you have to, you as an evaluator have to be able to evaluate your own staff and know who to pinch. And I'm same thing with you, Gibby. When you have a staff, you got to decide who you're going with or not. And uh, I think it's a critical part of this job. Oh but yeah, it- you know it, it, these guys, these guys, you know, the, yeah, there's, there's certain guys that they kind of single themselves out. You know that that, that have you know a little maybe evaluate things a little bit better, and you lean on those guys. But it, it's very important for morale that you trust everybody, and and that's what you've done. And you know what else is kind of interesting? Your two GM jobs. You know, I, I'm I'm going to preface this by saying, you know, as coaches and managers, right? We want everything. We think there should be no limits. You should get everything you want. Blah blah. blah. Oh that's, yeah, that's just the mindset. Okay. And, uh, you know, the two teams you've been general manager for, the two, the only two corporately owned teams in, in baseball, right? Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, but I'll tell you this. I think it's a great thing being corporately no. owned because you don't have an emotional person saying, I was at a party and this guy or they, they see a guy making an error or walk guys and they want you to trade them. And I think having corporate ownership is, is great. Now, from our standpoint, Terry, Terry McGurk's the control person. Uh, so he's, you know, he has the full powers of the owner, but he's great because he's been a baseball for so right. long and he understands the position and he understands you're not going to bat a thousand and he's phenomenal to work for um, because he realizes it's not always going to, going to work out and he's very supportive, which is what you need, right? You know, when things aren't going bad, you're getting pounded. Paul Beeston did a great job of that too. You'd lose five in a row, six in a row. You see his name coming on your phone. You're thinking, oh boy. And uh, it's actually the, the, uh, it'd be completely the opposite, right? When things were going poorly, that's when he would pump you up the most. Or, you know, we were going bad, and I'd say, oh, we're facing Verlander tonight. And you're, you're sitting there thinking you're down on dumps. He'd be like, is Verlander, is he undefeated? I didn't think he was. You know, and he was always glass half Yeah, he was going. very good about it. And that. I think it's key, you know. And, you know, and Terry here is the same way that when things are going bad, it's easy to, you know, to pile on. You're getting it already from media and fans. Having people you work with be supportive is huge. Right. Yeah. And my, my point is, though, it's like if we, we as coaches, we think, hey, hey, go out and get this dude. Well, it's not always that easy. You know? the team, oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. The, yeah. It's a budget, budget. There's limitations and all that. And uh, But we can sit back there and say, what the hell is he doing, man? Is he going to do anything? What have you, you know? And, and, uh, and he, <laughs> obviously, you got to figure it out. You know, I don't think we ever totally figure it out. But obviously, you know, your track record speaks for itself. Wow, that was uh, very cool, John. It's going to be a two-parter. That was part one. Excellent, man. Hey, that boy can talk, man. I thought I talked a lot. Alex can talk. Yeah, that was uh, fabulous, and I'm sure everyone's going to be talking about it. But now it's time for the Ask Gibby segment. Uh, Some exciting news here uh, at this segment. Uh, Beginning this week, if we select your question here on the podcast, you will receive a gift package from Budweiser. If you want to ask Gibby a question and have a chance to receive this gift package from our sponsor, Budweiser, because that's what buds do, just send your questions to us at askgibbyshow at gmail.com or the Twitter hashtag AskGibby. All right, our first question is coming from Twitter. 
and it's John Eaton at Johnny Creative. Hey, Gibby, back in the day, did you ever get Alex to tell you to make certain calls on the field like it seems happens today, or were you pretty autonomous? <laughs> well, hey, the times, you know, it's what I, I you know, I, I said earlier in the show, Alex trusted his managers like he trusted me Then you know, now he, he's got Brian Snitker. You know, Snit and I are a lot alike. You know, we've been, you know, we both, both baseball lifers. We've been around. Um, and, and so, you know, he was managing the team there and he knows all the players. But he, he trusts his managers um, to run a game, right? But, you know, when, when I say that, it's not like they, you know, they, they totally do their own thing. They let you, let you, you know, do whatever, do go do whatever you want. Because when in a good manager, general manager relationship, you're always talking about whether it's players, what's going on in, uh, in strategy or what, what you were thinking when you made these moves, because, you know, you're all in this together. It's not like me against them. Right. Um, so, but, you know, when, when they, when the game comes, I mean, you you know, it's not like the GM's up there in his box put, picking up the phone going, hey, make this move. I think some people think that sometimes. But there is – I've heard some stories about certain teams have analytics guys that are kind of on their peripheral. In, that are right on the field. Yeah, right really close. And I thought that was illegal. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But but they may say, hey, you know, the, the, I guess they track the game, the inning, whatever, all that stuff, and kind of – I don't know if they pass on some info. But, no, he never did that. Not, he doesn't do that now, I'm sure. But he – one thing about Alex, he understands analytics. That's a big part of his. But he also understands the human element, and he and he knows Brian Snitker. He knows John Gibbons. I hired them to do these jobs, and I'll hold them accountable. If I don't think they're doing the right job and the team's not playing well, you, you deal with it. But no, I, I think you know what. There's a perception in the game today from the fans yeah, and from others that you know, everything is being dictated by the GM or the president of baseball operations well, telling them what to do. I think a lot of it is in in certain places, and um, you know, as far as but in your knows, case, it didn't happen when you were. No, in I, you know what? To tell you the truth, I wouldn't allow it. I sorry, I couldn't do that. I, I would have to say, you know, you know, you probably need somebody else, man. You know, take take the analytics guy in your office, just put a uni on him, man, or make him like uh, who was it? Uh, was it? Uh, who was the old famous owner? He he wore a suit in the the dugout. Uh, Connie Mack, wasn't it, Connie? Connie yes, Mack? Connie Mack wore the yeah. suit and the, and the hat. Yeah, they call your analytics put, guys. Put him in a in a suit, let him sit in the dugout, and then there's nothing lost in translation. If that you know, if you're going to run everything right. out, but right. that's that's there you, exactly. there you go. Uh, good answer, good question, and we have the second question uh, for Ask Gibby today. This one is coming from the Gmail account, askgibbyshow at gmail dot com. This comes from Sarah underscore Lee, and she wants to know what your favorite ballpark is and why, and a bonus for mentioning any games that stand out at that ballpark. Well, you know what? Fenway Park, that's my favorite. Frank, Fenway Park in the old Yankee Stadium, you know? The, yes. And I, I think a big part of that is the history of both those places, but I got to say Fenway because, well, it naturally it's still active. You know, just the atmosphere, you know, my roots are from Boston. You know, shh, I don't tell anybody. Mom and dad are born and raised in my blood. That's the, that's the uh, the bad guy in me. But, you know, there's just, you know, there's just something about it, Johnny. You know, the configuration of the place, the, you know, the famous green monster. There's Yeah. The fans are into it. You know, they're very knowledgeable. It's not it's not like the fans just rag you. Boston fans, man, they, they they know what they're talking about. Some you might get somebody to get some somebody just ragging you up there, and you go, "Damn, that dude knows what he's talking about." It's kind of like when I, I our first show when I had Donaldson on there, we go to the meet at the mound, and Donaldson would say something about strategy. I'm going, "Damn, he knows what he's talking about." But shut up anyway. You know, same thing with these Boston fans; they oh know God. the numbers, man. They know stats. But that's my place. And there's and last thing because I know it's a special place to you too. You know. But yeah. there's a there's a long hallway that leads from the clubhouse to the dugout in Fenway, right? Mm -hmm. There's like green mold and everything all over. It's like back when you know Mickey Mantle was running there, spitting on the floor and all that. So that that, that kind of thing, right, just excites me and I love it. And, and um, 
you know, and I and I know to you though too, right? Because yeah, you know, you it, 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 uh, for me, I have to say it's the it's my favorite park as well. And I've been to so many major league parks. Uh, I was at the old Yankee Stadium when I was a kid, and I saw Mickey Mantle play. And but Fenway, I went to school there. I went to college uh, up in Boston. I lived in Kenmore Square, which was right around yeah. the corner. Yeah. Uh, and my first year was 1975. That was the year of. Uh, the Sox getting in the World Series. What a what a first time experience and being in Boston. Uh, we would we would actually before they put the big scoreboard up, we would a, we'd be able to watch the games from the roof of our dormitory. That's how close we are. That's awesome. And, and it was like incredible just to be in your dorm and hear the crowd. And I just love Fenway. Uh, and my my uh, greatest experience as far as being at a game at Fenway was. In 1978, it was the Bucky Dent game. Ooh. It was the one-game playoff, and I'm telling you, um, that place was electric until that home run, and and then it sucked the air out. But Fenway, to this day, is still my favorite ballpark, as it is yours. Yeah. And you know, Johnny, the funny thing, I say, and I say, I say this to everybody, it's like, because you, you, I think I, I'm, I have a right to say it because my, my family's all Bostonians, right? Like you know, for, for the longest time till they what was the year they finally won it won it all? You know, they they coughed so up so many. And I was with the '86 Mets, your boys, when yes. they coughed that one up too, right? Yep. Uh, but they, yep. I don't remember which year they finally won it. And I and I always say to everybody, the worst thing that could ever happen to Red Sox fans is they they finally won it because now they got nothing to bitch about. They got nothing. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that's my family. It's like, but no, but they still obviously they still find something. But you know, one little, one uh, more little quick thing too. In eight nineteen eighty six, you know, when the Mets did beat the Red Sox in the World Series, they used to have a Jimmy Fun game. You know, Jimmy, they were the big right. sponsors of Jimmy Fun for you know the kids with cancer and mm-hmm. a lot of different you know, charities. And so we, as the Mets, in eighty six, went up to play. It was like in the beginning of September to play the Jimmy Fun game. And that's the only game I ever got on the field at Fenway Park as a player. Wow! Got to catch catch the end of it, you know. And uh, so I thought, wow, this is this is pretty cool. We, of course, we ended up beating them in that game too, the charity game. But you know, it, it kind of predicted the the future. But it's a it's a it's a special place. It, it really is. And um, you know, there's so many great ballparks out there. But I think you and I kind of feel the same thing. We're, we're you know we're baseball lifers, and it's kind of mm-hmm. history matters, you know. Yeah, that was kind of cool. I mean, uh, just mentioning that you were able to actually catch some of the late innings uh, at Fenway on the field. Yeah. That had to be really special for you. Great memory. Yeah, because cool. yeah, I have family there too, man. Because yeah. I told you, man, you know, I don't tell people, but I'm a New Englander by, by blood anyway. In, in ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, John, I mean, Boston's great. I love it. That's my favorite city. Yeah. That's my favorite city, no matter all my life. I've, I've loved Boston uh, more than anything. The best memories of my life were there, really. Uh, but that is going to wrap up this Ask Gibby segment uh, each and every week. Now that we have Budweiser coming aboard, uh, and that's what Buds do. We're going to give uh, prize packages, not prize packages, gift packages from Budweiser. If your question is selected, and there's two ways to do that, you send us an email at askgibbyshow at gmail.com, or you just... Go on Twitter, hashtag Ask Gibby, and each and every week we'll pick two questions, and both of them get prize uh, merchandise packages from Budweiser. Uh, nice. John, that's a fabulous show today. What an exciting show. Alex uh, was phenomenal with you, and uh, can't wait for part two next week so everyone could hear that. But uh, great show today, my friend. Yeah, I was. You know, it's the it's best time of year in baseball, right? We, we're it coming is. down to two teams. This is what we all live for. and. Uh, before we go into the hot stove league, you know, so let's, let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy it. And we'll have more about the world series and Toronto blue Jays news next week. And the second part of one of the most fabulous interviews I've ever heard. Hey, hey I got to ask you one thing before we leave real quick though. All right. Are the Mets in the world series? Are you no. still, are you still in mourning? Sorry. I, I hate to rub it in because I'm an ex, I'm a metropolitan too. Right. I got to wipe them. Stereo. I'm already <laughs> looking forward to 2023. Hey, you know what? Maybe they maybe they'll trade for Otani. You never know; they might get Otani. I think there's going to be a major facelift of the team. There has to be, but all the free agents they got, and Cohen is not going to stand pat. So, uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing that uh, in future weeks. 
Hey, your owner, he wants to win, man. He's like the old Steinbrenner. Nothing wrong with yeah, that. Yeah, he, he, he's, uh, he's got this, too. He's going to spend it. And Let's we'll win, see what baby, happens. Like Al Davis. Al Davis. Exactly. Is <laughs> Al Davis. <laughs> well, that'll wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. We'll talk more baseball with you next week right here. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>